Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. A very, very welcome to New Horizons 2023 here in Dublin. On behalf of the steering committee, Piga. Hello, well, you all know me. I got not work. Yeah, it does. No? I know. Okay. Well, you, you all know me already. I'm Piga. I'm from Chile, but today here I'm representing North, Central, and South America. And in their name, I would like to welcome you all to this new version of New Horizon GIS 2023. I'm a patient, a group leader in my country, and I've been part of New Horizon G since a long time ago. So thank you very much and welcome all of you. From the steering committee, from the steering committee, we also have David Josephy from the Life Raft Group in Canada. We have Sarah Rothschild right here, Life Raft Group USA, Chinser Sawyer from Support International USA, Markus Wartenberg, German Sarcoma Foundation, and myself, I'm Martin Wettstein from Switzerland. I'm GIS Group Leader in Switzerland since a few years, and also of um, the New Horizons GIST uh, Steering Committee. New Horizons it has a great history of 20 years. In 2003, it was developed by Novartis Oncology for CML and GIST patients, a conference for patient advocates. The program has always been developed by steering committees from us, from the patient advocacy groups. We had nine face-to-face -face meetings between 2003 and 2011 in Diesenhofen, Switzerland, where we have uh, founded, and then in Milano, Dublin, uh, Budapest, Bad Nauheim, Baveno, Lisbon, Wösendorf, in Austria and Amsterdam. Further milestones in the uh, New Horizons history was uh, uh, compliance issues which we had to resolve. We separated the CML from GIST. We handed over uh, the organization completely to the patient communities. And then we started to change between Europe and USA, once it was in Europe, once in uh, the Uni United States, between 12 and 19. Eight face-to-face -face meetings in Paris, Miami, Zurich, Miami, Barcelona, Wayne, Vienna, and Wayne again. Then, of course, we had to change because of the pandemic to virtual meetings. And now, today, we have a virtual meeting. And I would like to welcome also all the people at home. Could we see the people at home? Hello, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Somebody else coming? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I'm sure there are dozens more. <laughs> OK, thank you. New Horizons combines medical update in GIST. That's the most important we want to know. Best practice in GIST, how do we treat? How can it be treated? Exchange with top experts and pharmaceutical companies. Patient advocacy, exchange of experience. Patient support, capacity building. Projects in collaboration and inspiration, understanding how different our world is, and, of course, friendship and fun. <laughs> I have some organizational things to say. Um, this is a hybrid meeting. We have uh, delegates joining remotely. 
Remotely, uh, delegates also via Zoom are welcome to join discussions by raising the hand or using the chat. Moderators and speakers, participants, be punctual, be on time because um, people at home would like to continue. Coffee breaks, we have that outside here in the foyer directly in front of our meeting room. The hybrids, of course, have to bring their own coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and lunch is right behind us and um, further information you will get during the course. So I would like to place a big thank you, a big thank you to the organizers. That's uh, Michi Geisler and Catherine Schuster. They did a fantastic job again. Thank you very, very much. A big thank you also to all internal and external speakers. Thank you. And of course, also to the funders, our colleagues from the healthcare industry, especially Blueprint and Decipher. Thank you very much. Without the support, this meeting would not be possible. And last but not least, all of you in the steering committee. So I think we would like to start with our first presentation. I hand over to Piga. It's, we're gonna use this. It's my pleasure to introduce to all our Professor Robin Jones. <laughs> Professor Jones is currently a consultant medical oncologist at the Royal Marsden and head of the sarcoma unit at the Royal Marsden and team leader in sarcoma clinical trials at the Institute of Cancer Research UK. He is currently working on a number of trials of investigational agents in sarcoma as well as laboratory-based studies with Dr. Paul Huang. He's a specialist in the treatment of bone and soft tissue sarcoma and focus on developing novel therapies for these diseases. He has been principal investigator in numerous phase one, two, and three trials. He completed his medical training at the Guys and St. Thomas Hospital and his oncology training at the Royal Marsden. His postgraduate research degree with Professor Downset at the ICR, evaluated potential predictive and prognostic factors in breast cancer patients treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In January 2010, he was appointed Associate Professor and Director of the Sarcoma Program, program at the University of Washington and Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. He, he led a successful clinical and research program at, and continued his translational and trial-based research. The laboratory work with Dr. Seth Pollack evaluated novel immunotherapeutic targets in bone and soft tissue sarcoma and has led to a number of early phase immunotherapeutic clinical trials. Professor Jones is a member of the Sarcoma Alliance for Research through Collaboration, SARC, Concept Review Committee, European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, Sarcoma Group, the American Joint Committee on, on Cancer, Soft Tissue Sarcoma, Staging Panel. He has previously served on the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, Educational Committee, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, Bone Tumor Panel. Dr. Robin, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction. And as I say, it's a real pleasure to, um, to be with you today. Um, I, um, I think for this talk, there's one basic message, and it's, it's a really good message, that there are more drugs available to treat um, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and there are lots of really exciting drugs in um, development. So I think the message is quite clear, and I will I've got a lot of slides, 
but I think it'll be good if I jump through many of these slides and open up the um, discussion because I think the sessions this morning were just fantastic in terms of the um, interaction and the questions um, asked. So uh, be warned, I'll point to people in the audience for their uh, comments and questions. I'm looking at Jane, but... Uh, <laughs> But um, as I say, I think the message is really, um, really a positive one. The title I was given was How to Treat Just Today, uh, the Previous Therapy Algorithms, an Overview and Changes and in Innovations. So with that, I'll um, move on to my disclosures. And I've got a relatively uh, simple plan um, for this lecture. Um, the first is a brief introduction. Um, Second, we'll focus on localised disease, um, particularly on the uh, trials of adjuvantamatinib. Um, and then the, 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 uh, the biggest um, component will be on advanced disease with a, a brief overview of the trials of amatinib in advanced GIST, uh, sinitinib and rigorafenib, and of course more recently uh, repretinib and avapritinib. And then um, a little bit about the uh, clinical trials that are in um, development right now. And I think this ties in quite nicely with uh, John's uh, presentation uh, that follows this one and with Ramesh's presentation um, tomorrow. So I won't focus much on um, circulating tumor DNA or the treatment of uh, KIT and PDGFR alpha uh, wild type GIST, but focus more on the fact that there are lots of clinical trials um, in development for GIST. So I think everybody in the audience knows this um, GIST or um, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor is the most common uh, mesenchymal tumor of the um, gastrointestinal tract. And of course, the main thing here is that they're characterized in the majority of cases by activating mutations in KIT and PDGFR alpha. And of course, this has led to um, a real revolution over the t last 20, 25 years in terms of the treatment, particularly of advanced disease, with the intro introduction of a number of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which have resulted in an improved outcome for patients. But I suppose, as with all um, sarcomas, the major thing is that there are many different subtypes, and um, this slide highlights this point. So our understanding, I'd say, of GIST and the biology of GIST is so much better than many of the other sarcoma subtypes, and we can classify these tumors in terms of their uh, molecular uh, makeup, as illustrated on, um, on this slide. And one of the uh, points to, um, to highlight regarding um, some of the recent clinical trials is the introduction of avapritinib for uh, tumors harboring the um, otherwise drug-resistant uh, PDGFR alpha D842V mutation. So um, the second component is a discussion regarding localized um, disease. So it's essential to highlight that the mainstay of treatment for localized gastrointestinal stromal tumor is surgical uh, resection. But from uh, data published by Ron De Matteo and colleagues over 20 years ago, despite complete surgical resection, about 50% of patients do develop, unfortunately, recurrent disease. And that's shown on this slide. Dr. Di Matteo and colleagues uh, performed a trial of adjuvant um, imatinib. So this was a placebo-controlled phase three trial of over 700 patients. And uh, this um, recruited people who had tumors greater than three centimeters removed. And this trial was a positive trial showing a benefit for the imatinib arm. So the recurrence-free survival or the time taken for the cancer to come back um, uh, uh, the recurrence free survival was 98% for imatinib at one year and 83% for placebo. And this was a very, very positive trial and resulted in the introduction of imatinib for uh, resected high risk disease. And this is the uh, Kaplan Meier curve from that trial showing the benefit for uh, post operative imatinib with the blue line at the top compared to the um, dotted line at the bottom for placebo. 
Since then, the Scandinavian uh, sarcoma group have performed a trial uh, randomizing people to receive either one or three years of post-operative imatinib, and they recruited uh, patients that had the following types of tumor resected. So they had to have uh, tumors greater than 10 centimeter, the mitotic count or the activity of the cells under the micros microscope had to be greater than 10 per 50 high power field, and um, tumor rupture was also um, included uh, as a uh, risk criterion in this trial. So this trial, again, was positive and showed benefit for uh, three years of post-operative imatinib compared to um, uh, one year, both in terms of recurrence-free survival and also for overall survival. And uh, this is shown on this slide, basically illustrating the benefit for three years of post-operative imatinib compared to one year. So one of the um, things that we are uh, waiting for um, now is the results of another trial performed by the um, Scandinavian sarcoma group with colleagues from uh, Germany and the rest of Europe is the result of this trial. So a randomized trial um, recruiting people who've had very high risk uh, tumors resected to either receive three or five years of adjuvant imatinib and this trial has um, closed to uh, recruitment, and we hope that the results will uh, be available over the next few years. So in terms of advanced disease, um, this busy slide illustrates the fact that imatinib, um, since the phase one trial, the first in human uh, trial, really um, has revolutionized the treatment of this disease. Um, with a rapid transition from uh, phase one to um, drug approval, both in North America and uh, the rest of the world. So Matnib established as the standard first line therapy. And um, in terms of subsequent lines of therapy, um, we briefly discussed the uh, use of placebo controlled arms in the session earlier on today, but um, there are um, three trials that have been performed with uh, placebo as the control arms, so uh, a placebo control trial of sunitinib, as well as rigorafenib, and of course, m most recently, repratinib, uh, leading to FDA approval of all three um, drugs. But I suppose the major thing um, to emphasize here is that um, resistance to these um, um, drugs develops, and there is a, a, a clear need for more treatments, potentially more effective combination therapies uh, to um, treat these resistant mutations that can develop. So this is the um, phase three trial of sunitinib versus placebo showing a benefit for um, sunitinib and this led to the um, approval of this drug in North America and the rest of the world and also the um, uh, GRID trial of uh, uh, rigorafenib in uh, imatinib and sunitinib pretreated um, patients, again leading to the um, approval of uh, rigorafenib for gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And this is the, um, the primary endpoint for that trial was progression-free survival or PFS, so the time taken for the cancer to get worse, and that's shown on this slide. So recently, um, two drugs have uh, gained FDA approval. The first is uh, repretinib, and um, uh, we performed a uh, randomized phase three trial of repretinib versus uh, placebo in people who'd previously been treated with imatinib, uh, sunitinib, and rigorafenib. And patients could cross over if they were on placebo and the cancer got, got worse. And this is the um, design of the trial. The other thing to note is that um, the standard dose is 150 milligram once a day, um, and people on the 150 milligram once a day, if the cancer got worse, could go on to 150 milligrams twice a day. The primary endpoint of this trial was progression-free survival, similar uh, to the previous rigorafenib trial. And the baseline characteristics of people recruited into this trial um, relatively consistent with um, uh, a population of people treated previously with imatinib, um, sunitinib, and rigorafenib. And again, this trial was clearly positive, as you can see from this um, graph. So the, 
The red line um, uh, is, represents uh, repretinib, and the sort of grayish blue line uh, represents placebo. So you can see there's a big difference between, um, uh, between those two curves. And the median progression-free survival for repretinib was 6.3 months compared to one month for um, placebo. Um, and this was a statistically significant result with a hazard ratio of 0 0.15. And I suppose one thing that's led from this is the, um, the role of placebo control trials in GIST in particular. And I think it'd be good to have a discussion um, um, about this because this trial has really made me think um, that we should adopt a different approach as we discussed in the earlier uh, session but again, we can, we can talk about that after uh, I've finished my presentation. And in addition, there was a benefit for um, uh, repretinib um, in terms of overall survival, as you can see uh, from this curve. Say so that repretinib is um, a, a relatively well-tolerated drug. Um, one of the things that's um, noticeable is hair loss compared to a lot of the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use. Um, but in general, uh, certainly compared to sunitinib and rigorafenib, it is a, um, a well-tolerated uh, treatment. Of course, all medications can cause side effects, so fatigue, nausea, abdominal pain, constipation, muscle pain, and diarrhea, amongst other things. So there's been a, a further trial of repretinib, a phase three trial, allocating people to either receive repretinib or sunitinib, a second-line therapy for uh, advanced gastrointestinal stromal tumour. And this trial showed no difference between the two arms in terms of the effect of the drugs. So uh, the median progression-free survival, the time for the cancer to get worse on repretinib, was eight months compared to 8.3 months for um, sunitinib. But again, one thing to note is that the side effect profile of um, repretinib is better than that of um, sunitinib. And um, again, this is something that it would be good to discuss with all of you. Drug access um, in countries is, is a real challenge, and certainly Ramesh and I um, are confronted with um, real issues in terms of um, trying to um, prescribe um, repretinib and avapretinib for um, people that come to see us in, in clinic. And um, I think, it's, in a way, and this is my view, and maybe I should leave this for the discussion at the end, but it's really disappointing that um, the funding uh, body in the UK has not approved um, repretinib based on the um, fourth line trial and has not approved um, avapretinib based on data that I'll show you now. But I shouldn't get involved in politics. I should just calm down and carry on with my lecture. <laughs> I, th I thought I'd liven it up a little bit, but maybe I, I don't. <laughs> so moving on to um, avapritinib, as I mentioned, the, um, the PDGFR alpha D842V mutation is notoriously um, resistant to um, the drugs that we have available, and um, avapritinib is a, a drug that targets this um, well, and we performed a... Um, phase one trial of um, avapritinib in um, people with tumors harboring the D84TV mutation and um, other types of KIT and PDGF-alpha um, mutations. So as you'd expect, the characteristics in terms of age, uh, mutational status, uh, metastatic sites, um, and size of uh, target lesions was consistent with a um, uh, pre-treated population in the majority of uh, cases. But I suppose coming back to um, Peter's point from one of the sessions earlier on today, this is the sort of um, graph or slide that I really like to show where all of the um, bars virtually are going the right way. So tumor shrinkage in the vast majority of patients. And I just wish that all our trials had this sort of um, results. So, you know, essentially a 90% um, response rate, which is just fantastic to see. And similarly, in terms of durability of the um, response in this um, um, molecular subtype, so very durable benefit from this drug. And similarly, in um, 
in uh, the fourth line setting as well. I suppose one of the things to sort of bear in mind with this drug compared to a lot of the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use is that the side effect profile is slightly different. So with this agent, neurocognitive side effects, or, um, which can range from subtle um, concentration issues, uh, problems with focus, to very um, profound memory loss can can be problematic, and it's really important to recognize this early and to either stop the drug or to decrease the dose and then recommence. Um, so this is different in many ways to the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors that we use. And in terms of the other side effects, I'd say um, they're, 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 they're manageable, but the neurocognitive side effects can initially be quite subtle and Sometimes patients don't, uh, don't notice these. It's their family members that pick up on them and say, well, he, he, he's lost focus. He, he doesn't remember things as well. So it's really, really important to, to pick up on these side effects. In terms of um, the importance of um, networks and connections and working together, um, I've got um, this as a, as a case study. This gentleman was 46 years old when first um, referred to us for um, the phase one avapritinib trial. Um, had been treated at his local hospital with other tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, essentially with no real um, clinical benefit. Um, and essentially has been on avapritinib since that time and had a really, really a big tumor. So that line just shows you the extent of this huge tumor, which was really having an impact on his, um, on his quality of life. And, um, oh gosh, my eyesight is so bad, I can't, I can't see the dates, so you'll have to tell me the dates of this scan. But anyway, he had a fantastic uh, response to, um, to treatment. Um, and um, after a few years, we actually asked our surgical team to, um, I wonder if there's a... Oh, I, I, but you can see the line that I've drawn on the tumor as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe I should just turn around to look at the date. But anyway, it was a few... But it was a, a fantastic response to treatment. And um, one of our surgeons, Dirk Strauss, um, um, we discussed the, um, the, the scans in our multidisciplinary team meeting. And he um, uh, took this gentleman to the operating room and removed the residual tumor. And he remains um, disease free up, up until this year. So it just shows you the difference that can, um, can be made. And, Again, the local doctor getting in touch um, and trying to sort of find out, you know, if we had a, had a clinical trial, it's really, really, really important. Um, um, so, and he has two jobs and he works really, really hard. I thought I worked hard, but uh, he, he's uh, at another level. But anyway, so he's doing well. We have had to cut down the dose of um, avapritinib um, because he's had um, memory um, problems, not severe, but we have cut down the dose. And again, following on from the discussion with Sydney earlier on um, today, it, it's almost a, an experience-led um, approach rather than evidence-based. So we've, we've tailored um, his schedule um, a little bit, um, on, you know, depending on side effects and uh, tolerability. But as I say, last scan about two months ago, disease-free. So a fantastic um, result, really. And of course, uh, following on this theme that not all sarcomas are the same, not all gists are the same, is that um, the uh, KIT and PDGFR alpha wild type gists are, in, in essence, many different diseases. And Ramesh will talk a little bit more about these um, tomorrow. Just to mention that Jason Cyclic does have a phase two trial of temozolomide in um, SDH mutant or deficient GIST. Um, um, and again, you know, proving that it's possible to perform clinical trials in very, very rare uh, diseases. And then just briefly um, to highlight that there are a number of exciting clinical trials in development for um, advanced GIST. So a number of new drugs uh, being evaluated in clinical trials, which is clearly a really, really good thing. Um, 
And the first of these is a, a drug called mesoclastinib. And uh, John uh, has been heavily involved in the development of this, um, uh, of this particular drug. And um, there's going to be um, a randomized trial, basically, of um, this drug in combination with sinitinib versus sinitinib um, alone. Just a note regarding repretinib, um, an exploratory analysis of the um, phase three second line trials, so the intrigue trial, um, using uh, circulating tumor DNA. Uh, this analysis demonstrated a meaningful clinical benefit for a repretinib compared to sinitinib in a specific molecular subgroup. So patients with tumors um, harboring um, mutations in KIT exon 11 plus um, exon, uh, KIT exon 17 and 18 um, with a median progression free survival for repretinib in this molecular subgroup of over 14 months compared to one and a half months for uh, sinitinib. This is a highly significant um, difference, obviously. And this has led to um, this trial, which um, I think is really, really exciting in terms of um, really a sort of precision approach to uh, the treatment of gastrointestinal stromal tumor, um, allocating patients with tumors harboring these mutations, so KIT exon 11 plus KIT exon 17 and 18, to either receive repretinib or sinitinib. So really sort of precision medicine um, approach um, to, um, to drug development. And again, it may be possible to discuss this at the, um, at the end of this session, but almost my thought on this is with such convincing uh, retrospective data, do we really need to go to all the um, expense of performing another um, prospective trial? But um, maybe we can discuss that at the, uh, at the end. So progression-free survival is the primary endpoints with uh, all the usual uh, secondary endpoints in terms of overall survival, uh, response rate and safety, as well as um, uh, quality of life, et cetera. So just really, really briefly, there are a number of other uh, drugs in uh, development for advanced GIST. Some of these have, um, haven't got a, a real name yet. They've got um, numbers. So the uh, first one is IDRX42. And um, in preclinical data, this has shown uh, activity against um, uh, most relevant KIT mutations in um, GIST and have also shown um, really uh, promising um, efficacy um, data as well. And this has led on to a, um, an early stage clinical trial, which will be open in, which is open in North America and, and in Europe. So again, really good to have these options available for disease progression. Another drug is THE630, again, uh, another um, next generation pan kit inhibitor uh, with activity in all the relevant um, uh, kit mutated GIS. And um, this uh, drug as well has shown promising activity in preclinical um, studies, which will lead on to um, a um, clinical uh, trial. Um, in um, various settings in terms of uh, pre-treatment. So again, it's really important to highlight that there are um, a lot of clinical trials for patients with advanced GIST. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of communication and um, networking in terms of um, patient referrals for clinical trials. And there is another um, a small molecule uh, kit and PGHFR alpha inhibitor that's going to be um, uh, evaluated in um, a clinical trial. So, so really, really exciting time with a lot of um, drugs in, in the pipeline and a lot of options for patients. So I think with that, I've said I've, it's good to have the discussion rather than me just talking. So I think it'll be really exciting to, to see what the results of the three versus five years adjuvantimatinib trial show. So say there are a number of promising um, agents in clinical development for advanced GIST. Um, I suppose, and this leads on to John's presentation and Ramesh's presentation tomorrow, 
there really is a need for um, further work on the optimal sequence of treatment for individual patients with um, specific molecular subtypes. And I, I, I think I think we really need more um, data in, in that regard. And I think over the next few years, we'll get a lot of inf information. And hopefully, we'll be able to guide treatment in terms of drug sequence and optimal um, therapy. So with that, I'd like to say thanks very much. And now it's time to get down to the politics. Uh, <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Now we are up to speed. I'm sure we have uh, questions to Robin. Who may I serve with the microphone? One question anyway. No, no, it's, it's good, Jane. I was going to ask you uh, to ask a question. Yes, so. it's a free strike. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, um, in your presentation earlier, you were talking about um, this issue of placebo, a placebo arm, and you had different thoughts on it. I'm just interested to know what those thoughts are. Uh, my personal thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, the results of the uh, repretinib versus uh, placebo trial were quite sort of um, striking in terms of the um, poor outcome of people um, allocated to the um, placebo arm. And I think given the fact that there are so many... Um, active agents available in GIST, I wouldn't be happy uh, performing another placebo um, controlled trial in advanced GIST. And as John um, mentioned um, earlier on, um, there is a, John's disappeared. I probably bored him so much that he's... Uh, um, there, there, we have written a, um, a piece uh, with Sarah about the... Um, the, the, the need to change um, thinking in, in a way regarding um, placebo control trials, particularly in GIST, but um, maybe you can add. Great. So, we, I mean, I think it's the, the life group and like the general policy has always been opposed to placebo controlled trials. Um, and I think it's interesting that you mentioned the trials. And, um, it was so great to bring experts together with us to discuss this issue. And uh, Dr. Serrano brought a biostatistical team to evaluate the placebo trials in the past and take those data points to offer a, 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 an option as a synthetic control arm. Um, so we put that together in a paper and fingers crossed I hope it gets published because I'm hoping that that will be serving as a reference point for any future clinical trials that are being planned that the, the expert community along with the advocates really wants us to rethink how we're building these trials. Um, but to, I'm curious though, just to build off of that, Jason Siklik was involved with the iSpy trial, which was thinking of using a, per, a patient's individual history as like a comparative arm for future trials. And I'm wondering, we didn't really build that into that paper, but I was wondering like what your thoughts are with taking it on an individual approach as a comparator. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's a really nice idea from Jason. I, I think there are challenges in terms of um, going from one line to the next line of treatment in terms of almost the, the sort of volume of disease and the, the, the heterogeneity of, um, of, of these tumours that um, it, it's harder to treat fourth, fifth, sixth line, in, in my opinion, because the, the the tumors evolve and become more um, heterogeneous. And it's interesting because all this work on tumor heterogeneity, um, um, the, 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 the famous New England Journal um, publication in renal cell carcinoma, the, the data on um, heterogeneity in GIST predates that, um, clearly showing that different um, evolutionary uh, paths. So I, I think it's a nice idea because of the sort of challenges and because there are, um, um, the interpretation could be harder, I, I think that that will be really hard to um, justify to a regulatory agency and uh, difficult to interpret. But I, I think it's a nice idea. Yeah. I mean, this, this idea of 
um, the cruelty of a placebo arm is, is not something I'm unfamiliar with. I, I'm not sure if it was at a previous Spain conference or whether it was at one of the ESMO conferences, but I'm pretty sure there was one of the leading uh, doctors from one of the Scandinavian countries. That actually, this was this was something he was putting on on the table for discussion. So, um, you know, separate from GIST as a whole, the whole principle of a placebo arm is something which I think you, you will probably rally quite a lot of support for to, to change the system because it isn't the right way to do it. Yeah, I, I agreed, and and particularly for for GIST, I think where. Um, there, there are a number of drugs that haven't been evaluated in phase three trials, but still have activity. And if you've got access to those drugs, um, allocating somebody or offering somebody a, a placebo control, control trial, I, I, it's 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 really troubling in in, in a way. And I, I think the um, I'm not sure if I can put the slides back up of the uh, repretinib. Um, Invictus trial, where you know there's such a marked difference in terms of outcome for um, the, the, the people originally allocated to repratinib versus those allocated to um, placebo. Was there a crossover? Yes, but even so, it was too uh, late, was it, by the time the well, uh, that's a that's a really good way of putting it, actually, um, Jane. That you know that the, these tumours are very bulky, you know a lot of um, heterogeneity in terms of mutational um, um, landscapes. So um, I think it's really, really hard. I suppose for regulatory agencies, if there is no effective therapy for a particular disease, you could argue that some treatments are very toxic. And um, But, I, I, you know, it, it goes into a bit of a circular argument a little bit. And I, I think, you know, this... And this curve, you know, the difference is is, is really, really quite clear. Um, but I mean, r I'm sure it's good to get Ramesh and um, John's view on this as well. Um, I mean, I agree with you 100%. It's a it's a challenging situation. Back to the earlier point, the off-label agents. You know, there's these phase two studies, prospective, and there's lots of retrospective data that some of these agents have activity like cabazantinib, even um, pazopinib. And so it's, you know, and, and, but it's a challenge getting the agents. I mean, it's, it's globally well, a challenge getting those agents in the U.S. too. Um, and, should, and then we do put a lot of work into publishing retrospective or phase two studies, and they never they don't get approved by the FDA. They might make it into NCCN guidelines, but um, there's some activity there, and and that's in my opinion, you know, better than giving somebody a placebo. Well, I mean, I, I think this this curve sh says it all, really. Um, so I mean, uh, Ramesh, uh, thanks, um, Robin. It was a fantastic talk. Um, I think one of the things we become a bit complacent in GIST is that uh, we kind of accept that, that we do randomized trials with the placebo arm, which I think we should we should have stopped this long time ago. Um, every single placebo arm had a median PFS of six weeks, four to six weeks. I mean, we know that already, that you know, patients progress once you take them off the TKI, and often they get worse symptomatically worse, and disease progresses sometimes quite rapidly, and they don't, nearly about half of them won't be fit enough for uh, the next plan of therapy because the disease has progressed and then PS has dropped to maybe two or three or even four. So that's something which we need to learn, and when we do trials in the future, or the present trials, we need to make sure that we don't have a placebo controlled arm. We don't need that. I come from a lung cancer background, and we have learned from the rare subtypes of lung cancer that we don't need a randomized controlled trial with a placebo arm. Proof of concept, proof of principle, target, drug works, drug gets licensed, and NICE says yes. And that's what we've been experiencing in lung. But, I, I, you know, coming back to Ava Pritnip, I think um, it's really disappointing that, um, um, you know, the funding um, was... Um, it, to, and you know something works this well for a very rare disease. It's just um, really 
infuriating. I... That, that was again to do with the way the costings rather than nice being horrible. I, I, I'm not defending nice. I, I'm not defending nice. I think, I think what we need to learn is to engage with the farmer right at the beginning. Where are they going to pitch the cost of the drug and how they're going to do it? Rather than actually just picking up a number or some, some figure from somewhere and this is what we're going to charge knowing very well that when they come to NICE, that is not going to be, because you haven't been on NICE committee, I've been on NICE committee. I, I, I fully, um, t you know, t take that on board. But again, I think that this is sort of compromise that can be had for such a, a, a incredibly rare um, uh, tumor type with a drug showing this degree of um, efficacy. I, I just don't understand why there, there can't be a sort of middle middle ground, but anyway. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, this is what you would call. I mean, first of all, thank you for your talk, which was absolutely crystal clear and very comprehensive. But we are now at this sharp point in Canada and in the UK. So let me ask you quite directly, what do we now say to the patient? Because I'm now getting oncologists writing to me as the leader of the patient group asking, how do I get my patients access? The oncologists are asking me how they get access to the drug for their patients. What do we say? I, 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 yeah, that, that's a great, um, great question. And I, I don't have a, um, a good um, answer. What do you do? Well, what do you personally do when you have? I'm not being accused. No, no, no. I like it. I, it's, this is what I like. It's, you, <laughs> it's not an accusation. It's yeah. a question. When you have a PDGFRA patient and you know you have the drug and you know they can't get it, what do you say to the patient? Maybe, maybe can just just step into this topic. Um, just, just to assist him a little bit in his discussion. You showed us all these innovations now coming up. You can stop all these innovations, trials, immediately, yeah. immediately, if patients don't get in the future access to these drugs. That's the issue. And this has not to do with the bad governments that will not pay for the drug. It has also to, to do with the price policy of the drug companies. And, and this is one of the issues more and more because they raise up the prices from, from, from uh, face to face and we end up with, with drug prices for uh, targeted therapies of $300,000 per year. And this will be not any longer uh, fundable for the patients. So on one side, patients don't have access to the drug. This is an ethical issue. But also from my perspective and from perspective of also health economists, this is quite stupid from behalf of the company because they are avoiding a lot of revenue by leaving patients out of, 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 the, of, the, of the spectrum. And also we should not forget all these innovations, all these clinical trials, patients put their lives in risk by taking part in these clinical here, here. trials. And doctors, also you, you're putting a lot of energy in these clinical trials, and then you end up with a situation where maybe only patients, I would say Germany, maybe I don't know France, and then US, maybe three, four, five countries have access to this drug. This is not acceptable, definitely. So we can stop any innovation if the companies don't understand that they really need to come up with affordable drug prices. That's my personal political statement to this. Uh, no, I, 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 I like it. And um, I think this is so much better than me just talking. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> this is my slider, blah, blah. But one of the things that I'd say that it is probably more expensive to develop um, drugs in a, in a rarer um, cancer, in, in terms of, I, I, it, yeah, in terms of, But, but that's why I think if there's, there's a need for compromise on, on all sides from the company, but also from the um, funding agencies uh, uh, as well, you know, just to sort of try and um, 
make this work because I mean, realistically for the um, for the UK in terms of uh, um, reimbursing um, avapritinib, it's going to be a handful of patients at most. And I, I just don't see why there can't be uh, some form of compromise. <laughs> Ramesh. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to disagree with you. Uh, I have to disagree. Um, I side with uh, Moxa. I think I have now, right now, in my lung practice, I got, I'm using seven different TKIs for lung cancer patients. They're all different mutations, meaning different genes. And they've all been approved by NICE or available through Cancer Drug Fund. They've all been already licensed, obviously, you know. But we have two drugs in a rare cancer like GIST. Both have been not approved by NICE for one simple reason. It's the costing. I know that ever a handful of patients per year in the UK. We know that. But it's the costings. As a country, if you say to me, Repritinib, for example, even the discounted price, you're talking of about 200K to 300K per year, whereas I can treat seven lung cancer patients with a TKI in the, with the same amount of money. That's where I have issues with um, when the companies come and talk to us. Oh, by the way, we pitch the price around 30K per month. Mm -hmm. It's unaffordable. But I, I, it doesn't matter I, what the total number of patients say. But I, I, I think the whole process, need, it, it's not just one element. It's not just the, uh, the drug company. I think it's the whole process that needs to be um, adjusted. And um, I, it, it just isn't working. Because th those two trials, the Repretinib um, a fourth line trial and the Avapretinib phase one trial, unequivocally positive trials and we don't have no doubt. I mean we're not doubting the efficacy of the drugs. It's just the way we where you pitch these drugs in when you actually come to funding is where we're we're failing. We're not failing ourselves, we're failing our patients as well. This is where we need to have the discussion with the pharma right at the But beginning. with the regulatory authorities as well, I I, I, right. I think yeah. I, I, I just want to say like the life raft group spoke with pharma even before like at the beginning saying about the drug pricing because we saw how Gleevex price really like increased over time and we say are you going to ensure that this drug is priced at an affordable level and we were talking about that quite extensively with them and they still chose not to listen to us and the patient feedback and they priced it as it was but I do want to say I also pointed out to blueprint that that trial um, got to, the drug got to market in less time than other trials. They the way they um, it, it was it was quite it was fast tracked in terms of like a, a standard Approved, time yeah. period. And so mm -hmm. I said, okay, so if it was less time that you brought that to market, and you you always give the reason you know companies give the reason while well, we're trying to recoup drug costs and development. What's the rationale behind that? Could I also jump in on what, if I could just rebut one issue that's arisen. The drug companies want to tell you how expensive it is to develop new drugs, and I understand that. But we're not dealing with an adventure into a completely unknown field here. We've had imatinib for 25 years. The test systems, the assays, the general chemistries are well established based on publicly funded academic research. They're actually not launching into the unknown. It, the drug costs for developing these new TKIs, I would bet, are really relatively low compared to a lot of other unmet needs. Your point is really well, well taken. I, so I, I show this slide again um, regarding the um, repretinib um, trial, where this analysis has shown a benefit for repretinib in, um, in this molecular subgroup. My question based on this slide, based on these data are, do we really need to do another randomized trial? The regulatory agencies insist that you have to have a, a, a randomized trial, which just adds to the the, you know, the cost and the, uh, uh, can't we? It's what I call the threat of evidence-based medicine. I call it the threat of evidence-based medicine. And the, the Sunitinib. You don't need it, you know. The Sunitinib median PFS is the same as placebo. Yeah, yeah. Why are we doing that? So what, what you know, what I would think, we, and, and this is probably just me dreaming, but it would be incredible if the, 
countries, governments would get together and they would say, we're going to be a coalition and we'll approve your drug, but we need you to have these prices for these countries. And then for low middle income company countries, we need to have these prices and actively set the prices instead of and this is mostly the U.S. government, instead of letting the pharmaceutical companies charge whatever they want to charge. But I, I think that that's... But I, I think that that's, um, that's a great point, John, because that should be dealt with at the start of the process rather than something that's negotiated essentially at the end after the, after the trial after the drug has been developed, it should be done at the start of the uh, of the process, rather than at the very end, where you know it's never going to it's never going to work. And you're right; it's it's so it's so infuriating in in a way that it seems to be a recurring theme. So maybe there's a maybe there's a, a another way to do it, and it's a it's an opportunity for nations and. Um, patients to work together. Um, <clears throat> I, re I was asked once to present on what innovation means to patients by a drug company and um, stood up and said, well, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing because my patients can't get it. They can't get the access. And maybe instead of glorifying the outcomes of a clinical trial on how good that innovation is, we should glorify how many patients got access to that treatment. So instead of saying, I... instead of saying as clinicians and patients, oh, this is really good, we get X amount of, of months and we get um, progression-free survival and so on, until such time as you can tell me what your cumulative months when I add those months plus the number of patients that got that treatment, then it's a good blockbuster. I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree, and I, I come back to this. I come back to this slide where I, my my question is: Why do we have to do another? Um, why do we have to do another randomised trial when the the evidence is so compelling? It's the the process is out of control in a way. The regulatory process is is sort of dictating everything. And and you're right. The success should be the overall success of a drug in terms of people receiving that treatment all over the world, not just in specific um, countries. Yeah. Yeah. I like this because it's so much better than me just talking and talking and sharing. Moving away from the political side of things, I want to ask a very scientific question about the inside trial. Why did you choose sunitinib as the control arm? Would not be better of having regrafenib as a control arm, which is... Uh, likely to be more effective against exon 17 secondary mutations. So we'll be comparing with a drug which has got activity against 17 against a drug which is likely, hopefully, maybe better than the other drug. But I, I, again, Ramesh, this comes back to the regulatory process where sunitinib is the second-line treatment. But regardless... The PFS is 1.4 months, which but, is, as but, John was saying... But, but this, this is my whole point. Why is this trial necessary? Not Why have the... Yeah, absolutely no need. So I, I, I think they are saying that they would like to use real world data, but I think there are huge challenges um, with that. And um, so far, I think the use of real world data in rare cancers hasn't been. Um, that impressive in terms of um, drug approval. I think in terms of documenting the um, natural history of a, of a uh, you know, say a newly identified subtype of um, molecular subtype of sarcoma, the response of that subtype to, to chemotherapy, the, the real world data has been used quite extensively. But in terms of drug approval, I think there is still quite a bit of um, reluctance from the regulatory agencies to actually use those data. I, I think they talk the talk in a way, but don't walk the walk. And I, 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 maybe I'm being a little bit cynical in, in, in that respect. But I think that point um, regarding the definition of success, you know, in terms of 
how many people all over the world obtain access is something that's quite powerful and that could be um, almost used as leverage to, um, to, to, to you know, get more drugs um, approved. Because as you say, it's pointless saying, well, this dr drug works really well, but you can't have it. I mean, that's just, just crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's effectively wasting the public's money. A lot of that um, pr preliminary work was funded by public m money, and now you're creating something that you're holding back from the public that paid for it. Uh, uh, but I suppose, in a way, I think the, the whole process of drug approval is so complex now and so expensive that it's very difficult for. Um, um, an academic group to, you know, to, to do a, um, a, an international um, multi-center randomized trial. Again, mm. that may be a little bit negative um, mm. f coming from me, but I, I, it's, it's such a cumbersome process, really. Um, yeah. Um, I would like to get a word to Jörg. Yeah, my name is Jörg Forster and I'm from the Swiss CHIST group and I would like to step away a bit from the political discussion that we are just now doing. That's my fault for always getting politics involved <laughs> in the discussion. Yeah. No, but, but you were showing uh, different new substances that are getting into a trial phase. And my question would be, will, are these substances then designed to fight one, one specific mutation, or are there also substances in there that will be, um, can be used for different mutations at the same time? Yes, so a lot of these drugs will uh, fight different mutations all at, the same, um, all at the same time, hopefully. But again, you know, that's no guarantee, because um, when tumors get bigger, um, they, there are more mutations, uh, more resistance uh, mutations, and they become much, much harder to, to treat. But that's the aim of a lot of these drugs, to cover um, all of these sort of resistant mutations so that there's more, more activity. Hmm. Just a short comment uh, to this. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the future treatment in GIST because so far we have had different lines. And I'm not concerned if, if we send patients to you or to John or to Ramesh or to Peter, I'm fully aware you, you exactly knowing what you are doing, so that you, you are doing a good job with the patients. But there are a lot of doctors out there, they don't know what they do because they have a lot of issues with therapy and side effect management, so there are a lot of things going wrong. And now, if we get more and more drugs that will be very specific, you need to have a higher knowledge in treating these patients. So this is the other way around for us. It's not having the drug. The question is what kind or um, do we need the drug in the right hands to be beneficial for the patient. So we need to think about how we want to treat GIST in the future by not that every doctor can treat the patient because he, he has no experience or has no knowledge in this. So it's getting complicated, more complicating in the future. That's my feeling in the moment. Yeah, no, I, that, that's a fantastic point, actually. And um, I think there are two um, things. I think, again, it comes back to um, communication and links with um, doctors that aren't in um, um, sarcoma centers. and I. I really think that that's very, very um, important that they um, have that sort of access and can phone up and uh, you know refer people um, quite quite easily. Um, I'd say in the UK that there's a relatively good setup in that respect, and in other European countries that that that's quite a um, a well-established and um, a relatively easy process. I'd say, you know, in the United States and Germany that it is um, a little bit different in that respect. And certainly in the US, there are lots of um, community um, oncologists that, that, in a way, um, um, I found when I worked in the US that it was very good to, you know, really emphasize, phone me if there's anything or just get in touch if there's anything that, um, 
you're you're not sure of, or you know, if you've got any 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 questions. But that was very sort of um, ad hoc, and it was a sort of personal um, relationship um, with, with individual oncologists. And I, 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 your point's well taken, Marcus. I think that that will be um, problematic. And I think for a drug like avaprotinib, um, it's um, particularly important because of the unusual um, uh, toxicity profile of that um, that drug. As I was telling John, uh, there are a few community oncologists that still sort of occasionally phone me, maybe just for a chat, but... Uh, <laughs> Hi, Robin. Thanks for your presentation. I'm just going to go down a different avenue and ask you, from your experience, um, is there any role for stereotactic radiation when it comes to GIST? Um, so my uh, simple answer to that um, is yes, that there is a role for um, uh, radiation um, in, in GIST, um, particularly uh, when patients have um, symptomatic um, uh, tumours, uh, particularly later stage GIST if they've got bone metastases, um, radiation can be very useful. We've also found it quite useful for um, large um, rectal gists if, um, if there's been progression on, on, on imatinib. And there's also a role for um, other, other techniques such as ablation for um, solitary areas of um, progression. So, for instance, um, if somebody is on imatinib and um, there's a solitary area of growth in a, in a liver metastasis, then that can be easily treated with, um, with ablation. But I suppose, um, as I say, my answer is yes. And taking a step back from that, the, the, the bigger picture answer is it's always good to think of um, alternative approaches um, if, so that somebody can stay on imatinib or sunitinib for a longer, longer period of time. Um, so thank you for the question. Ramesh is going to take it back to politics now. I love it. <laughs> I actually, no. no I, I really, I, I'm going to take it back to politics. It's really important. <laughs> it's really, really important to talk about this because it's 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 such a. I was going to tease Ramesh, it's not only my eyes that are, are my yeah, hearing as well. We, 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 we've been taught, going back to 20 years ago, that GISs are relatively radio resistant, but it's not necessarily true. So we use um, uh, radiotherapy for local symptom control, for example, patients with bone metastasis or a bleeding GIST, or one area in the, say, peritoneum growing and everything else is stable and it's not ablatable, for example, with radio frequency ablation. We use radiotherapy either stereotactic or a conformal radiotherapy and deliver a decent dose of radiation. So that actually is doable and that's allowed in the sense that it's not doesn't require an extra funding. It's part of the management of the cancer patient that you use radiotherapy as part of the treatment plan. So that's the first thing. And second thing is I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, uh, seriously, I think what it is is that I'm quite radical uh, in the way Marcus was describing about um, gists and other kinase driven cancers should not be treated by community oncologists, full stop. That's the first thing. Second is they should not be treated by people who are seeing one or two patients a year and they should be treated in the big cancer centers and people who have got experience in dealing with the drug. They know the pharmacology, they know the, the toxicity profile, how to intervene, when to intervene, how to be one step ahead of the drug. I think that's one of the problems we have in not just in UK but other countries as well. Because I treat lung cancer, that's one of the issues I have in lung cancer. Some of the rare lung cancers are treated in small hospitals. It should not be treated, and that's my personal opinion. So I, um, I, I, I agree with that. And again, this follows on from some of the discussion um, earlier on, particularly a um, number of people from the US were mentioning you know, the geographic barriers to um, uh, to travelling to um, referral centres. So I think in the UK, you know, things are um, relatively good in, in, in that respect, that there's a good sort of network. Um, but in some other countries, I think it's really, really hard to do that. And trying to change that is, 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 is very, very difficult. Very, very difficult. 
I have, I've got a couple of questions which probably will come back to politics. Um, so the first one is, I was curious as to, you know, in the relative countries, is there like a, like a league table of how many lines of therapy, the, the drugs there are for GIST? So for instance, in the UK, we know there's three that have been approved. How many is there in the US? How many is there in Canada? How many is there in China? I guess my question is, one of, the, one of the ways that you can sometimes shame people into doing things is to show a league table and show that actually in these countries there are four or five drugs that have been approved for use, whereas in this country there's been one or two. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, yeah, no, I, I think you're right. Some, some, um, some governments probably are beyond shame. I think um, certainly the way that we try and do it in the UK is to apply for compassionate access. So um, as Ramesh mentioned, compassionate access, carbozantinib. We used to have expanded access, repretinib. So there, there are ways to try and um, increase the number of lines, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I think for certain countries, that may be very, very difficult. There may be um, a, a limitation in terms of um, being able to get into an expanded access program. And of course, there may be limitations in terms of clinical trial access as well. But certainly, my approach has been to try and have as many clinical trials open as, as possible and to have as many um, expanded access programs um, open as possible. Um, that creates its own problems because, you know, the, the, it creates more work in, in, in our hospital, but it does enable patients in the UK to have access to, to drugs that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Okay, and I guess my, my second shame question then is, is actually to the drug. I, I can answer you, in Latin America, we only have access to first and second line in some countries. That's all we have. So patient depend on clinical trials or, or expanded access programs. Yeah, we, the, the patient, we get together and use the data from the, our registry to, to advocate for the, for the drugs. And that's why we got the two first one, first and second only. I was, uh, I was teasing, I think, uh, Jane and John at lunch. The, um, John had been to a bookshop and there were loads of Oscar Wilde um, books. And uh, I, with the administration, with the government, I used the Oscar Wilde quote, um, a cynic knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. So um, it's so true. Uh, and I guess my second part of the shame question was then talk, focusing on the drug companies. So I was at a patient centricity conference in London um, last week. And somebody on a panel next to me basically said that the drugs companies, you know, they should focus so they're clearly going to focus on the blockbuster drugs, the ones that they're going to make lots of money on. And then they've got their kind of you know, fair weather drugs. And he was basically saying that they should have like a philanthropic drug set as well, where they basically aren't necessarily going to make a lot of money or a lot of profit, but they are going to make some money on it. And those drugs are the ones that they are targeting specifically at rare cancers or rare types of yeah, I, it, it's it's such a oncology drug development. I think is so um, so challenging. I, th I think part of the problem is that so many of the trials are negative, not just in rare cancers, but in in common cancers as well. And that sort of, in a way, pushes up the the price. But I think essentially, it just needs a complete revamp, um, really, and. I think the point regarding having these negotiations at the very start, I think, would be um, would be better. And actually, having a sort of global, almost consensus, as John mentioned, in terms of look, if this drug gets approved, the the, the price in this country should be X, the price in that country should be Y. I I, I don't know. It's 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 such a difficult topic, and really, really, as I say, infuriating. Change Question going back to one of your early slides about the three to five year trial that's uh, 
hopefully going to be ending fairly soon. What do you use as a, uh, an, a distributor of imatinib? What do you expect to be the changes that you have in your access for your patients or redistribution or what, what do you have in mind? Uh, so, uh, um, presupposing the trial is, is, is positive. Assuming it's positive. Yeah, so I, I, I think um, given the, um, uh, um, the, the status of amatinib in terms of patent and everything, in the UK, um, I don't see any major um, issues with, with, with drug access um, if that trial proves to be um, um, proves to be positive um, because compared to a lot of um, other drugs now um, you know the, the, the price has gone gone down so I, I, I think I'm optimistic um, that um, that access will not not be a problem but I may be positive and Ramesh will tell me off for being positive now, I think. Well, we try, to, we try to be positive, but at the same time, you do have patients who've been on imatinib for six, eight, ten years, and they just decide, well, I'm going to try getting off of it and see what happens, and within a short period of time, they have a recurrence. Do you, how do you, you treat those people? You put them back on imatinib? Uh, so, um, I, in my practice, yes, I, I, w I would put them back on, on the matinib if there is a, is a recurrence, yes. Yeah. That's a question right here. Yeah. So, I would just like to make a comment uh, that the doctors in India are recommending rep, uh, repriptinib and avatinib, but in India, the, we do not have the access to these medicines. I don't know it's the government or the pharma companies who are not providing the access of these medicines still yet, the, but the patients are willing to take it, uh, take the trial. The doctors are willing to recommend the patients to the trial, but we do not have access to these medicines. That's the only problem. Yeah, I, I, again, you make a, a fantastic um, point. A number of, um, I know a number of uh, oncologists in India and um, that, that we've had sort of discussions, um, particularly regarding uh, repretinib and avapritinib, and I know one of the, um, the oncologists is actually trying to get an expanded access program set up, so I'm happy to sort of make an introduction um, to her. Um, she, uh, she's, she's, she's a fantastic oncologist, and she's trying her best to, you know, to get, get things set up. Mm -hmm. with regard to the variety of compassionate access programs. Maybe. I really like this. It's really interactive. <laughs> it's so much better than me just talking, as yeah. I say. Maybe two, two brief aspects. One is about countries like India. We have seen in history companies like Novartis building up patient support programs, like the famous GPEP program, that's one of the programs where these countries, third world countries, but also other countries, have had access. And you know GPEP with the Max Foundation and different other issues. So from my understanding, it is an ethical responsibility for a drug company if you come up with these kind of treatments that you also think about these kind of assistance programs in these countries. And I think every drug company has the responsibility and the ethical responsibility to think about these issues and really make things happen so that also patients in these countries have access to the drug for free or maybe for a limited amount of, of, of money. That's one part. And the other part to your topic is we have to make it uh, separation or differentiation between approval and reimbursement. When it comes to the EU, 27 members, in the moment when EMA is doing the approval of the drug, the drug is approved in all 27 member states. That's not the issue. So normally, theoretically, you have access to the drug. But then, Reimbursement is a national decision because there are different, we call it HTA, Health Technology Assessment, and this is different from country to country. So you have NICE in the UK, we have our wonderful GBA ICWIC system in Germany, I think in France, I don't know what's the exact, yeah. So there is a totally different uh, systems in place with totally different ideas how reimbursement should be done. I think you have the quality, we have uh, additional benefit or however we call it. So it's very different from country to country. And it could be in the moment when the drug is approved, 
and then maybe five years later you have 27 member states in 10 member states the drug is available in maybe 10 member states it's not available and in seven it's something like ongoing because the members uh, the, the, the HDA process is so slow or they delay delay the reimbursement so that nobody has to pay for it but uh, that's the whole thing in a way it just needs a complete Absolutely. revamp everything is just so overly complex yeah. in a way sorry I uh, sorry you were gonna say <laughs> yes yeah They approve the drug, but they make um, such a very complicated uh, context for reimbursement that, in the end, uh, the hospitals do not dare to prescribe the drug. So, I, 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 I'll ask Ramesh what his thoughts are on this. With, with NICE and Repretinib, NICE almost came up with all of these exploratory um, questions, exploratory analysis almost, you know, making it quote-unquote scientific, but at the end of the day, just say that the drug is too expensive rather than trying to find some sort of pseudo-scientific, you know, rationale for, um, just say it is too expensive for our country. It's much more... I mean, that, uh, that, that was the bottom line. <laughs> it, was, it was approved, but uh, the hospitals had to yes. pay. I remember to prescribe Axel, the, the medicine. So yeah, I remember Axel end, telling me. Yeah. It was so expensive that uh, very few centers dared to prescribe the drug. I mean, that was the bottom line for both avapritinib and ripritinib, the cost. End of the day, it was the cost. It's nothing to do with the efficacy or the, how the data was presented. Obviously, they have used a smoke screen to try and make it look scientific, but it was uh, cost. Going back to your three versus five years study, uh, the recruitment ended in September 2022. Um, so Spain and UK were the largest contributors to the study. The earliest you can expect any data is end of 2025, so three years from the uh, end of recruitment. And we can't prejudge whether five years is going to be better than three years. What might tilt the balance in favor of five years is the fact that the matinee become of patent in UK and elsewhere in Europe as well is much cheaper compared to Gleevec. So with there about five companies making imatinib, five or six companies, and um, they're definitely cheaper than Gleevec. Um, one caution about while we are actually on the imatinib, um, we are a bit nervous about some of the generic imatinibs which are coming through. We've done a study in Cambridge looking at the various generic imatinibs um, <clears throat> and we started checking the plasma levels of imatinib in patients who have switched from Gleevec to a generic or one generic to another generic and we found out that some of these patients, the plasma levels were very low, much lower than what we expected. So in Cambridge, what we've done is we have stuck to one generic imatinib where we have shown the plasma levels were adequate. So we only use one generic imatinib in uh, Cambridge out of the six. So something, it's a take home message for other countries where you're using imatinib, a generic imatinib. Sometimes you don't have any control over what type of generic imatinib you get in your hand. So sometimes it's a white tablet, sometimes it's a brown orange tablet, sometimes it's some kind of a pinkish tablet. We don't have a kind of control what the pharmacy orders. Sometimes they get the cheapest generic, may not be the best one for the patient. Just need to be aware. I just, I just wanted to update the group about access, going back to that controversial topic. And just to address the gentleman from India, is it the government or the company? So um, we've had talks with the companies, I mean, mainly Blueprint and, and um, Decipher, and they do explain how they're like resource constrained in terms of working on approvals across the world. So obviously Europe was like the first stop and I, they're gonna be working to other countries to work on those approvals, but they can't tell us those plans because that's, a, I guess, like a private thing for them to share um, with the outside community. 
But um, we did talk to them about the Max Foundation, and so we have gotten them in touch to see if that could be explored. Um, but um, just for the sake of transparency, like we have been talking about this for a long time with the companies about access. So we actually did a survey with experts and patients just to like understand what the experience is in terms of access issues and like what the barriers are. And we're planning um, in a few weeks to present to um, Decipher about these experiences and have a discussion about, so that they really understand the reality. And I know that some of them are in the room and they're actually hearing this firsthand. And I think they've probably also been contacted several times around the world from patients and physicians. But I think to formalize the process and really sit at the table and discuss this, this that's really important. And it's been a really wonderful collaborative effort among SPAN, Life Ref Group, the steering committee, um, and the experts to really all come together as one unified voice about how important this issue is. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention that action is being taken in terms of Thank addressing you. this issue with the companies. And I hope that it can come to some sort of outcome that's positive or, or even if we can establish some sort of paper or white paper or establishment that really like concretizes like this is our opinion and this is what matters and hopefully this can be considered for any other future issues that come along the way regarding access. Good. I would really uh, echo what uh, Sarah just said. Um, with regard to the comment from the fellow from India, um, at least in Canada, as ridiculous as the funding approval process is, they do actually come up with the number. We know the number. They said they would find repetitive if the price was reduced by 83%. Yeah. Not 82, not 84. 83% <laughs> was the number they came up with. Isn't that wonderful? And it's so gratifying to have that number. I, I, that, it, that, that's my whole point, Ramesh. You know, rather than coming up with some really sort of convoluted scientific reason for not <laughs> Why don't you just say it needs to be X amount cheaper than the price proposed? But yeah. you get to the quality value, below the quality value, you have to drop the price down. So they didn't say that you have to price down to 83 percent. But they did say, but uh, I'm not defending NICE, I'm not defending any of the <laughs> funding authorities. It's just basically what we are left with is a drug which is effective, is likely to prolong life, and also it's got the highest response rates in the second, third line setting. Indeed. Compared yeah. to sunitinib and agrafenib, repetitive has much higher response rates. I mean, does it matter? If the patient actually is on drug stable for a number of months, that's actually probably more important than tumor shrunk by 20%, 30%. But it, the objective, repetitive has got the highest response rates in the post imatinib setting than any other drug ever tested in uh, GIST. Mm. And we're now sitting here, one year, two years down the line, not able to access the drug. Blame the funding authorities. I would blame both funding authorities plus the pharma as well. I think some, and sometimes we have to blame ourselves as key opinion leaders, whether we should have interacted with the pharma right at the beginning. We actually had the discussion before, but whether we should have actually gently reminded them that this is where you have to pitch the prize and try and, as you said, you try, try your best. Sometimes people listen, some people don't. But if we actually have the dialogue right at the beginning when the drug is being developed and it's going to be licensed very soon, it got a positive result on the phase three trial and it's going to go live with EMA and FDA and MHRA very, very soon, you have to have the dialogue then and let's say don't pitch it up at because often what happens the rest of the world looks at nice uh, europe um, asia australasia they look at nice see what nice is doing if the nice says yes to a drug often we know that in other countries there's a positive opinion in the, from the regulatory authorities there so they, i think something which we need to feed back to the pharma not just from the gist point of view because i sit on the lung committees and we know we deal with big pharma, and we know that when you go this rare lung cancer, for example, very rare lung cancer, something like 2,000 patients per year, maybe 1,000 patients per year, 300 patients per year, why is this here, not there? This is the TKI for about 300 patients per year. We know what the dist price company was thinking, 
but the negotiations which are confidential, the list price is here, or the NHS price is here. So the drug is through. I do think, though, that the whole process needs to be um, completely um, revamped because it is far too um, far too complex and, and convoluted. It really, really does. But that's why, uh, in a way, I guess. So again, you know, my question is, why do we need to do? Yeah. So um, if I can follow on what both of you have said, maybe uh, doctors like to write consensus statements about how to treat a disease. Don't we need a consensus statement on how to price TKIs for GIS? Publication. Lay down the marker and write down what it what. I suppose one of the um, things that struck me is that um, doctors aren't that good at um, talking or di you know discussing finances and um, money. Um, I, I mean, you I, don't you, you don't need to write it. We all write it. We have just, just have the just sign it. We have That's all of, you have all of us here. That's a, that's a deal. <laughs> I would like to share with you how it is in our country. Swiss, Swiss Medic has approved Repretinib, perfectly approved. But the health insurances, they don't pay. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So each year, the raise of the fees for the insurance companies are between 3 and 5%. So the population is really holding back. And with the population, it's also the insurance companies. Yeah. I've, well, the insurance system in the, uh, in the US um, is so complicated. I'm sure John can um, elaborate on this. But I, I used to tease some of my colleagues that I found uh, this sort of bewildering array of sarcomas so much easier than the bewildering array of insurance companies and rules and regulations that they've... Um, they've got in place, it's just really, really challenging. Yeah. Any more political questions? Because I <laughs> Sarah's going <laughs> to... Um, we, we saw with the Insight study, um, the, uh, not Insight, Intrigue, how sunitinib and repritinib wasn't significant. But it was still a decent amount in terms of survival. So I'm just curious, you could speak on that, but also we have the Theseus, we have the IDRX, we have the Cogent, we have all these drugs that excitingly are in trial. How do we ensure that if it looks good enough, like how we can get it considered um, for approval? And I know that's all about the design and the comparator arm and, and all that, but I just don't want us to like lose hope if there's something that really can help show benefit for, uh, you know, a good PFS? Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I suppose in a way that's a moving target. I, the the sunitinib arm in the Intrigue trial did much better than you would have predicted from um, um, published data from the um, original uh, second-line sunitinib versus placebo trial in, in, in particular. But I, I suppose that's a reflection of... Um, of a lot of things in a way, but particularly managing the toxicity of um, sunitinib and um, you know finding the best um, schedule for an individual um, patient. But I suppose it's going to become an increasing question: what is the optimal design for a trial, given the fact that there are um, a number of um, drugs available, and also that sort of in a way ties in with access in different countries because if different drugs are approved in different countries it's going to be harder in a way to perform a, um, an international randomized trial if there are different stand I, it's just yeah and in a way you know this trial is um, I, I, again I I just this these data are compelling and I, I, I just don't see why we have to go through the process of doing another randomized trial when there are other drugs in development that we could be um, um, 
uh, assessing and evaluating for um, for for approval. Um, So I, 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 that's why, you know, coming back to Marcus's, Marcus's point, I think the whole system needs to be um, revamped because I, I think the regulatory agencies, and I, I fully take Ramesh's point, but I think the regulatory agencies are very sort of rigid and very dogmatic when it comes to, um, um, to, to, to rare cancers. And I suppose this sort of clearly highlights that, that um, regulatory agencies deem it necessary to um, to have a, a randomized trial to um, um, to um, you know to to get this drug approved so I, 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 I think it's not just one thing it's not just pharmaceutical companies it's the whole whole process that needs to be um, revamped so the regulatory agencies Jane have have um, um, mandated no, the, the FDA. It's, so not the reimburse, not the reimbursing agencies, but the. Um the well, I mean, I, I, I think there is definitely um, uh, something to be to be said um, for this because if the insight trial is positive i mean i i would be you know it would need a a, a a a a a commentary or a letter to say look why was this even necessary given these data um it's just like i guess my question was when when the regulatory authority say this is the trial or this is the process for the trial that you're going to have to go through, aren't they guided by what it is that the drug company is saying that they're wanting to prove? So if the drug company says, I want to prove or I want to market this drug as the new second line for GIST, then surely the, the trial would have to be di designed so that it would look at how is it going to be seen as the second line for GIST, right? So it would be compared against something else like sinitinib or a placebo. It, it, exactly, and I, I suppose that factors into Ramesh's question regarding um, using rigorafenib as a control, but the rigidity is there in terms of, well, sunitinib is the second line treatment, therefore it needs to be um, compared to sunitinib. It's kind of a circular argument, really. It's a circular, circular argument. Yeah, that's why my hair's here white. Because it's we're just here because there. We're here. <laughs> That's why all my hair is completely white. I, don't have I mean, I could also, if I can editorialize, the reason that the regulators insist on these crazy quantitative quality calculations and so on, it's, it's because they have no courage. It's the same reason why academic administrators want to measure impact factors and all this stuff. It's because they don't have the courage to make an value, to make a judgment call. Instead, they have to rely on some crazy metric. It's all marketing. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'll stop now. I, I, no, no, I suppose the academic um, process needs to be um, revamped as well. My, uh, my. Um, my BSc supervisor, he was um, um, he was Rosalind Franklin's uh, PhD student, and um, he took the um, X-ray crystallography um, pictures that Watson and Crick used, and um, basically because they published separately, um, he didn't get a Nobel Prize. But his comment was that if they tried to submit that now to Nature, it would be rejected. <laughs> you know, it's just like. Yeah. But anyway, I should stop before I start going on with my anecdotes. It's like it's tying in with the uh, introduction with the biography. Well, there's no other question or comment before we finish? I think John's uh, presentation will be much less controversial. So. Well, Robin, thank you very much. You, had, thank you. you were lucky to have the first one. Had all of us wait, we were waiting to, to express No, yourself. it's good to have the interaction. I, I'd really much, much prefer that. So it's, it's really, really good. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very, very much.